what would Nightingale have done with a fax machine? What would have she done with email? And now we're saying, well, what would have Nightingale done with YouTube? And we know we're getting ready. We know there'll be new media to take on. What would she have done with those things to bring, to amplify our voice, to amplify our concerns for the causes that impact upon everyone, the global health causes that impact upon individuals across the world? Why does Florence Nightingale's legacy matter much more than ever in the 21st century? Let's talk all about it with Dr. Barbara Dossi and Dr. Diva Marie Beck, international co-directors of the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health, right here on episode 378 of The Nurse Keith Show. Hey there, this is Nurse Keith. This podcast is all about you, your personal and professional development, your career, and the healthcare system as a whole. And I'm here to share, as always, education, ideas, diatribes, and informative interviews like today's with some of the most inspiring people from the worlds of healthcare, nursing, entrepreneurship, medicine, and beyond. I love having you along for the ride. And I thank you from the bottom of my nurse podcaster's heart for being part of the growing Nurse Keith Nation. And if you'd like to help other people find the show, please consider leaving a rating and review over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcast app you happen to use. And please also consider becoming a patron of the Nurse Keith Show at Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Nurse Keith. I appreciate my patrons and my reviewers so very much. I will direct you to nursekeith.com to find the show notes for this episode. And we are here with Drs. Barbara Dossi and Dr. Deva Marie Beck. It's so good to have both of you here. And Barbie, I want to start with you. And I want to ask you, what is it about Florence Nightingale that caused you to really sit up and take notice and decide? To become a Nightingale scholar? Oh, that's a, a great question, Keith. I think the most important thing to look at right now is our system of healthcare is in such crisis. In the late 80s, I began to just think about what is going on right now. Why can't we come together in a we space? Why is are we always pitting ourselves again? The, against each other. And I began to uh, see Nightingale quoted all the time. And I had never read a thing on Florence Nightingale. In fact, when I was in school in the 60s, we literally had a professor who said, don't worry about Nightingale. She died of venereal disease. And I'm going, you know, I want to be a nurse, but I'm not going to talk about that. And so I never investigated. And then it went, you know, we went to Clara Barton. And then I was in that era of nursing school where we didn't have his, the history of nursing. And I began to just read uh, a couple of secondary uh, uh, references on her. And then all of a sudden, I am reading this and I'm going, what? I, there's some missing pieces here. And I could see who was quoting who and keep on with the same diatribe that I was trying to find the depth of. And so I got the original uh, Edward Sir Edward Cook's book uh, published in 1913, uh, and it was the definitive biography of Nightingale. When I read that book, I wept and wept and wept. I went, why do we as nurses not know our history? And so from there, one of the things that was very important to me at that time is I was interested in looking at this holistic perspective. And so the work that I was interested in generating and looking for continuing education credit, uh, if it, it was called airy-fairy and that touchy-feely stuff of imagery relaxation back in the you know 80s. And I just went, you know, there, there's such a philosophical foundation to uh, what this is about. It's not external, just techniques, a little bit of hodgepodge. And so the more that I began to look at that, I just I just uh, was flabbergasted by what I personally didn't know. I found myself and thought of myself as a good educated nurse and a nurse leader as well as clinician. So I'll stop there. 
<laughs> okay. And thank you. And Diva, did you have a similar moment where you discovered that Nightingale might have been more than you originally gave her credit for? How did it happen for you? Oh, thank you for asking that, Keith. Well, I like like Barbie, I took my training in the early 70s, but the, the, again, we had a little bit of, a little bit in our little nursing history chapter. In our med surge book, we had a little picture of her as a lady with a lamp. And that's all I had. And again, in my early clinical, I was thinking of her as an old stodgy person, like like some of the supervisors that were in the, that day who were still wore their hats and they had their, their capes on and they were strict and disciplined. And I thought, well, that's the nightingale. That's the old nightingale. And then... Fast forward to my midlife crisis in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, I began to be dissatisfied with working in hospitals and working on helping nurses and hospitals to be more holistic. That's what I was doing in the 80s. I realized that, that a global citizenship opportunity was what I needed to take. Because I was seeing that global citizens were making a difference in the world uh, beyond what the UN was able to do, beyond what governments are able to do, the global civil society was driving the conscience of humanitarian efforts, like for Greenpeace was an example environmentally. And uh, over time, I got involved in Washington, D.C. and also in Ottawa, developing my ability to work as a global citizen. And through that, I discovered Florence Nightingale, by learning that she began her work in Constantinople in Istanbul. And by then I had had the opportunity invited to be, be involved at a UN summit in Istanbul on the NGO civil society side. And learning that Nightingale began her work there in Istanbul, I was able to work with others to develop a international tribute to Florence Nightingale at that UN summit, in the barracks where she actually began her work, that still exists in Istanbul. And that's how I began. Oh, Nightingale. I looked at her, the bio, bio, biographies, as Barbie did, and I discovered that she was a global citizen. And I was, again, flabbergasted. And that set me on a Nightingale, Nightingale journey that first for myself and then realizing if Nightingale was a global citizen, I wouldn't have to just do it for myself. I could think about developing a way for nurses to be global citizens in Nightingale's footsteps. Mm, that's beautiful. And Barbie, when you hear Diva say that, and I'm, you know Diva well, so <laughs> this isn't something new to you, but in context of our conversation right now, when you hear, hear her say global citizen and you hear her say a nurse as a global citizen, what does that ring for you? And what what would you like people to understand about the place that nurses can take if they choose to as global citizens? Right. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, just a great question. Let me just say a few things before we go there. I think it's important for our listeners to know that Florence Nightingale was born in 1820 and she died in 1910. Most people think, oh, she's maybe 1840, 1850. But the thing that is so important, and as we look at what a global citizen is, Nightingale began to write in the 1870s to 1880s. It will take 100 to 150 years to have the nurses that can change the health of the world. And we right now, the 27 million nurses globally, are the ones that Nightingale knew would come along. She was that much of a visionary. So it is important for us to look at, as a global citizen, what we have to do is to look at the specifics of what we can do in our own lives personally and then globally to look at what does it mean to be a responsible citizen. And where that starts, let's just look at nurses in the workplace. Uh, there, there are many stories I could tell, but I can remember in the 70s uh, and the 80s when I began to look at this and think of Nightingale and her work and 
what is it to be a global citizen? It is what I do as a nurse to look at the bio, psycho, social, cultural, environment, and spiritual, uh, you know, and cultural uh, aspects of the work. And so what I am doing individually at the bedside, what I'm doing individually in my personal life, all of that is what are those patterns where I can begin to create a, a conscious pattern of what it means to have health and well-being. And so as we began to look at just on a day-to-day basis, what I was going to say while, while ago, right there, in the 70s and 80s, when I began to apply what does it mean to be a global citizen, looking at then what was all this external influence on what's happening to the climate and so forth, I began to look at, well, what is this thing called climate in the critical care unit, which was my focus area for 25 years. And I can remember, well remember one day going to work and they had tried a new wax in the unit and I was sneezing like crazy and the smell was so disgusting and I went what is going on here and so I went to I'll never forget going to Willie who was the guy that that cleaned our unit I said what are you using on the floor today he said ah it's this new wax do you like it I said I feel sick right now he said Oh, I I didn't mean to make you sick. And I said, of course you didn't. I said, let's think about what this is. And I began to ask the other nurses on the unit. They didn't like it. And then there was one of the people on that particular shift that went home because she had an asthma attack. And then from there, this is when, you know, began to look at what is this thing called advocacy for the patient, advocacy for ourselves as nurses. And we formed a committee and began to work with housekeeping. And all of a sudden, one thing led to another, to another. And so that's how it starts is what are these little things? So I'll stop there, Diva, and I'll let you come in a few, uh, say a few things too. Okay, do you, shall I carry on with that same yeah, question, Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Feel uh-huh. free, Diva. Okay. Well, of course, you'll see here, it, there's a, there are very interesting intersections between Barbie's work and my work, and also some very interesting uh, diversities as well. So I'll carry on with the diversity. The thing about global citizenship that everyone needs to know, especially nurses, but everyone needs to know, at the global level, the tools we use are not blood pressure cuffs and thermometers and sheets and beds, all the things we use as tools as nurses. Global tools are all communication tools. And when you think about the communications that happen at the global level or the communications that are happening with regard to our global concerns, our concern for the Ukrainian war, our concerns for our politics, our concerns for uh, racial injustices, etc. Those are all communication concerns. And communications is what we use to learn about them and to advocate about our current, our causes. So, to be a global citizen is to participate in the global dialogue around a specific topic, around the causes that we care about. And of course, the internet has helped us considerably. Now, we can we can participate in the global dialogue if we feel that we have a voice to bring. And that's where we see what nurses can bring their voices, which are very more, very important trusted and important for nurses to to see their scope of practice emerging or evolving it broadening to the horizon of bringing their voices to the global dialogue as global citizens well well said both of you and you know it goes i can see how it goes from that moment on the unit when barbie realized that oh this wax can make a nurse go home with an asthma attack and maybe affect a patient with a respiratory illness or maybe without a respiratory illness to what you're saying, Diva, in terms of looking at the larger picture of the environment, politics, advocacy, what have you. And I, it makes me think of um, the uh, ANHE, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Those are some folks I should have on my show. Yes. And, and then it brings me to this 
organization you all have founded, which is the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health, the NIGH, and the work you've been doing around the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs, as they call them. So I've seen how nurses can advocate on the super, super local level, like uh, uh, Barbie was just talking about. And then we can look at this big, big, broad area. So Barbie, I want to ask you, if a nurse feels that she or he doesn't have the wherewithal to, you know, get involved in some big initiative, like maybe what you all are doing, but sees something really close to home, like what you mentioned on your unit, can they still consider themselves a global citizen if they're doing work that you know, holds meaning for them and they feel like they're contributing? Oh, it's a fantastic question. What is so important here to, uh, to look at is the dialogue we've got going right now is an expanded state of consciousness. When you wake up and you have a concern for yourself, for your family, for the people that you work with, then what happens is you are, you're shifting a possibility. And one of the things I would say right now with uh, Diva and me and the work that we have been doing is one thing for a person to do is to find a like-minded colleague, find your soulmate. And so there are many times in doing this work, and Diva and I met at the International Council of Nurses back in 1999 in London. And from there, I mean, we just, you know, it was just love at first sight. We were both a critical care background. We were interested in bringing complementary and alternative therapies into the work. And we just went from one place to the other. And we had, uh, Diva and I both uh, have, a lot of ideas, and we can think of a hundred things at one time. And so what we've done over the years of working together now, and it's hard to believe it's been since 1999, um, is we've done mind maps. And we have spent a great deal of time really looking at what is our mission, what is our vision, and what can we do to begin to stay steady so that we can have a dialogue that is going to impact uh, as many people as possible. Okay. So if we're having a dialogue, I mean, we're having one right now, the three of us. Mm -hmm. So Diva, when you hear Barbie say that in terms of collaboration, dialogue, you mentioned communication earlier mm -hmm. and communication and education are central to nursing. I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, without that nursing wouldn't be what it is in terms right. of our ability to articulate and teach and and be leaders in many ways, right? Right. So when you hear Barbie say that, we can we can band together in many different ways in order to affect change. And you're both Nightingale scholars. I mean, Barbie, you've written or co-authored over 30 books. Diva, you've written for evidence-based journals. You're widely published. You both have doctorates and you're both highly accomplished people. So Diva, when, when you take a step back and you, you pull the camera back and you look at it all, nursing has its place and we can really, there's a lot that we can accomplish. What do you see as the, the what's your vision for the nursing profession vis-a-vis -vis this this very complex world we live in what do you what would you like to see nurses realize about themselves and about who we are as a collective oh boy well <laughs> <laughs> she rubs her hands together <laughs> these these questions uh these questions could be unpacked or packed in gigantic suitcases and then in, in tiny briefcases. I'll do my best to do the briefcase version. Go for it. <laughs> I, as you were introducing that question, I was realizing that Nightingale's last major essay was called Sick Nursing and Health Nursing. Hmm. And she defined health nursing. She defined health as not only to be well, but to use well every power we have. Hmm. So now what powers do we have in our world today? And this is health nursing, 
not sick nursing, not bedside nursing, not looking after people who need our support because they're chronically ill or acutely ill or dying or being born. That's what Nightingale called sick nursing. Health nursing is a bigger role that we see nurses can move into in Nightingale's footsteps again. The role that she took in influencing and impacting upon global public opinion and influencing the leaders of her time to do mm. that. She also said in that essay, and I'm, I'll paraphrase here, she said, you must form public opinion. You, it's up to you to let the leaders know what it is you want, and they won't change unless you do. Can you repeat that one more time? Yes. Well, I, I, I'll be paraphrasing, so I might repeat it slightly differently. Go for it. Do it. That you must form public opinion. Leaders and governments won't, be, won't do anything to change unless you ask for it, unless you call for it. It's up to you to form public opinion. We must form public opinion. And of course, she wrote that in 93, 1893. When she had had decades of doing that herself, she knew mm -hmm. that's what it took. Now, I'd like to say one more thing about that, if I may. Yes, please. In 2001, Barbie and I had the privilege of uh, commemorating Nightingale's first Episcopal uh, service during, with the Episcopal calendar. In 2001, we, we were able to co-host a celebration of Nightingale at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which you may know is an Episcopal cathedral. And Barbie stood at the podium and said, we have 14,000 letters of Nightingales, in, and these are letters across the world and collections across the world. So what would Nightingale have done with a fax machine? <laughs> what would have she done with email? <laughs> and now we're saying, well, what would have Nightingale done with YouTube? And we know we're getting ready. We know there'll be new media to take on. What will she have done with those things to bring, to amplify our voice, to amplify our concerns for the causes that impact upon everyone, the global health causes that impact upon individuals across the world? I'm so glad you mentioned the notion of what would Florence Nightingale do with YouTube? What would she do with a fax machine like barbie asked because one of my questions for you all was going to be what would nightingale do if she was here right now in 2022 and right. how would she make use of what we have at our fingertips and barbie before we take a break i want to ask you a question and this is kind of reflecting on what diva was just sharing about you know how nurses can form opinion right public opinion global opinion what have you mm -hmm. and i've written about this and talked about this a lot the way that nurses diminish who they are, especially when they use that four letter word, just, I'm just a nurse. <laughs> so when you hear someone say, oh, I'm just a nurse or I'm just a critical care nurse or whatever, I'm just a school nurse. And you think about what Diva just shared, what's your response to a nurse who is using language that actually makes him or herself smaller? What I would do with that nurse is I would immediately say, stop mm -hmm. for a second and say, I am a nurse. And I would have them do that two or three times and to feel it and to get them to feel that shift in consciousness. And then from there, I would go into this legacy of Nightingale. And I would say, think of yourself as a living Nightingale. So tell me right now, what are you passionate about? What do you want to do? That's where I would shape it mm -hmm. and go. Mm -hmm. So you just used a word consciousness. And I know your husband, Larry Dossie, has written a lot about consciousness. Yeah. So when we have a shift in consciousness among a group like nurses, and we know, the three of us know, how powerful nurses are and and how much can be done because you've all done it. I mean, you two are living examples of what nurses can accomplish. So what does that mean to have a shift in consciousness when, when you re realign and rethink your purpose, your mission, 
what you think you might be able to to do in the world? How does that actually really manifest? I think one of the things that we need to start with, and we can do this also after the break, is we have to begin to look at our own interiority. Right now, if we're trying to accomplish everything outside of ourselves, we will not get very far. What we have to do is find a moment in time every single day, 15, 20 minutes. You've you've got to figure out a pattern for yourself to look at and reflect and to name what is it right now that is leading to my suffering. There is no way for any of us to get through life without suffering. We can look at the chaos in the world. We can look at the change, changes in every community and every society. We can look at the tragic things that are going on all around the world. So what we can do is when we step in and get very quiet within ourselves, have that conversation of where we can name it, then by naming that, we are able to use our skills and our knowledge to begin to help us look at doing one or two things that are going to shift from going into a negative space to staying steady and to lift us up. So when I say a shift in consciousness, this is what happens when, and, and that shift in consciousness allows us to identify what does it mean to work from soul's purpose. Oh. And so when I am, when I have identified that And even, I mean, there are days when I think I'm going crazy. Diva can say the same thing. And we sit there and we listen to each other. We don't judge what the other person is saying. We don't tell them how to do it or do it, but we just simply listen. We hold the space. It's like a container to go deeper and deeper. And then finally, what happens, as you know, in in coaching, is the longer you can hold that space for a person to tell his or her story, They often will come to seeing, ah, I can do this to shift. Oh, I heard myself saying that and oh, that. And they start connecting the dots in their life. So this is what's absolutely key. And I will stop there because I know you said we're going on a break. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) And, And I love that. Working from soul's purpose, I think that's very important and something you and Diva seem to have been doing for decades now. And when we come back from the break, I do want to talk more about this notion of the interiority, you know, looking at our own interiority and how Nightingale's legacy can help us achieve living as healthy people on a healthy planet, which seems like a long shot right now, but I think we are still working towards it every day. And then also the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and maybe how people can get involved with the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health if they would like to. So when we come back from the break, we'll continue with the amazing and inimitable Dr. Barbie Dossie and Dr. Diva Marie Beck. Hey, everyone, let's take a quick pause for the cause, shall we? If you're in need of personalized holistic career coaching to elevate your nursing and healthcare career, look no further than NurseKeith.com and NurseKeithCoaching. I can help you with your job search and interview strategies, resume and cover letter optimization, LinkedIn maximization, and envisioning the future of your career. I can also support you in launching your own business, learning how to write and blog as a side hustle, or launch your own podcast. And please note that you can receive 10% off your first coaching package if you mention the show. So email me at keith at nursekeith.com to schedule a complimentary 30-minute strategy session. Now, let's get back to the episode at hand. So welcome back to the second half of the episode. We're here again with friends of the pod and my friends, Dr. Barbie Dossie and Dr. Diva Marie Beck. And prior to the break, Diva and Barbie, we were talking about so many things. Barbie just mentioned this whole notion of looking at our own interiority in this question of what's leading to my own suffering. And that can help us move forward to what's what's leading to the suffering of the person next to me or the person down the street and the people in the next county or the next country. And that led to this notion of the soul's purpose. And we touched quite a bit on Florence Nightingale and 
why she's still relevant or maybe more relevant than ever. And we talked about this whole notion of the global citizen and what it means to be a global citizen as a nurse. And what would what would Florence do with the tools that we have at our disposal right now, like Diva mentioned? So Diva, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the this idea of looking at your own self first that Barbie brought up, you know, what is it that's leading to my suffering? And and what is it I want to do with myself, you know, with with this the power that I hold within myself? In in your writings, the work you've done, what you've seen over all these decades, what stands out for you about the the power that you hold as a nurse or that someone else holds? as a nurse and how we can, we can manifest that and really, really decide we're really going to have an impact in whatever way we choose. <laughs> oh, these, these large, these large suitcase questions to answer, to answer with little, little briefcases. <laughs> I know it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have pocketbooks. <laughs> uh, the, the, image that came to mind I was remembering that I was I've been privileged to keynote at five international conferences of the Commonwealth Nurses and Midwives Federation hmm. and this last conference that I I keynoted at March of 2020 this was the year of the nurse and midwife international year of the nurse and midwife and I ended the key I my keynote ended their conference and the folks that were attending were leaders of national nursing organizations of the 54 nations that speak English. And I thought to myself, these are leaders. I mean, these are people working at the leadership level concerned with their uh, leading their nurses, educating their nurses, helping their nurses with all the things they want to do, helping their nurses to move in the direction of making their nations more healthy. Hmm. How can I respond to this in the 2020 year? And I realized, and this was just, just pre-COVID. I realized that I wanted to say to these folks that nurses are on the vanguard of what all of humanity must become. Nurses have the caring, the courage, the commitment to do what we do. And we've learned that across these past two years with the COVID uh, pandemic, we've learned that nurses uh, are all of those things, committed, courageous, caring, against almost all odds, like Nightingale did. And we need humanity to be that way. We're, we're actually role models for humanity. Our attributes are what everybody needs to bring to making humanity uh, healthier, happier, <laughs> even even more prosperous. Hmm. Barbie, do you do you resonate with that that notion? Uh, I oh, I really do. And uh, to stay with this interiority yeah. and the question as we speak, uh, this is where Nightingale comes in as just a living legacy. Nightingale has endured because she has an authentic center. She had an authentic center that held. And she had a universal understanding of spirituality, accepting all religions. And again, to paraphrase uh, from uh, Cook's book, is that she saw all the world religions as pearls in God's necklace. So when we look at the suffering in the world right now, and we look at Nightingale's life, we can ask ourselves, what is it that we do individually that will allow us to stay steady and to come from a place that is authentic? And as we move in this arena to look at being global citizens, uh, and this is what Diva was speaking about, is nurses are the role models. So if we can come into any situation with one, three, five, ten people, ask a curious question and get them to enter into a dialogue and share what it is among themselves that really matters, 
this is where we use our communication skills in a new way. And this is absolutely key. When people can get to that level of sharing a story and other people are holding the space to listen to that, then that story being told, every one of us can resonate to different aspects of a person's story. And then it helps us to remember how we've gotten through suffering before and what we can do that is different. So I think that this is absolutely key is to look at what is this place within us that allows us to go to work, to engage in whatever we're going to do in our community, our schools of nursing, hospitals, whatever, where we are we have an authenticity about what we believe to be mm. true. And so we're, we're talking about some, what some people might see as fairly esoteric subjects, like, you know, that the soul's purpose and looking at our interiority and suffering, which for some people that might seem they, they can't quite hang their hat on that. But, but at the same time, if we take all of that and we, and we put it in the context of, let's say the work that, the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health is doing and the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and how nurses can be part of this conversation that's happening at that international level, looking at these particular markers of global health that we can actually have an impact on. Like the the first um, United Nations SDG is to end poverty. And the second one is to end hunger. So that we're looking at food security, we're looking at agriculture. And somebody might say, well, that's not, that's not really nursing. Like that's not what, what I went to nursing school about. And Diva, isn't that actually what nursing is really all about? You're doing it again, Keith. I know, I know it's a habit. (laughs) I'm testing you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to actually share this uh, just briefly a story about a nurse in Toronto mm. who is doing just that. She, her name is Kathy Crow. She's very famous now, a Torontonian, a Canadian. She saw nursing as looking after homeless people. And she's the nurse that advocates for the homeless people of Toronto, which is a gigantic task. Yes. And she's got. She's got scores of people helping her now, seeing the connection between poverty and hunger and, uh, and the other issues, of course, that, that contribute to homelessness, and seeing that she's actually achieving health and well-being for those people, for those homeless people, and expanding the horizons of nursing's role in a very powerful way. That's a good example to answer your question in a pocketbook <laughs> that that was almost a right. wallet but that was that was great um, <laughs> and and let me say let me say a little bit about that too it's very uh, important when we look at these 17 united nations sustainable mm-hmm. development goals the central thread that runs through all of those 17 sdgs is good health and well-being In fact, good health and well-being is number three in those 17. Everything a nurse does is about trying to move to that highest level for that person to reach their potential for good health and well-being. So everything a nurse does is helping the person in front of them reach for good health and well-being. So that might be figuring out how they live in a food desert and how can we get that person yeah. food, right? right? Or they live in a neighborhood exactly. where there's, there's a, a super fun site and there's to- toxic air. What do we do about that? Right. Or there's right. violence in their neighborhood. Right. 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 So or dirty water. This, or dirty water or lead or exactly. so all of this is, is truly nursing, right? Exactly. Okay. It is nursing. Health is not only to be well, but to use well every power we have. To use well every power we have. Okay. Let's take that and blow it up a little bit then. So if we have the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health, Barbie, how how did that begin? Who, Who started it off? Who made this organization come to light? 
And what's the basic mission of NIGH? <laughs> well, what I'm going to do is I'm also going to shift to Diva because it was her husband that was with us when we oh. started this. But, but what we did is we began to look at this. Why are we so impacted by Nightingale? How has Nightingale helped us in our career to really be responsible to look at how do we create health local to global? So, Diva, take it there and speak oh, about thank Wayne. thank you. <laughs> Uh, the, this was 2000, uh, 2003 at a Sigma Theta Tau International Conference in Toronto. Barbie and I joined with our colleague, Louise Sealanders, who is also an American Nightingale scholar, and we made a presentation at this conference. And as it happens, my husband, Wayne Kynes, was there. He, we weren't married at that point in time. We were friends. And he said, let's, let's meet at, uh, at a place I really love, the Royal Canadian, uh, sorry, the Royal Canadian uh, Military Institute, which was just down the street from where we were meeting. And we had dinner there. And he woke up the next morning and said, I have a declaration for you, the Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World. And this was in the context, in, perhaps you remember in 2003 in Toronto. There was a, a, yeah. a SARS, a SARS outbreak around oh, the world yes. that became epidemic. Well, actually, SARS is a precursor to COVID, and people were dying, and nurses were dying, and the mayor of Toronto said, "Well, everything's under the control," and the nurses said, "No, no, no, they're not under control. Nurses are dying. We have to still work on this." So, at, in that context of the SARS epidemic emerging for our world. Wayne came up with this Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World that begins, we the nurses and concerned citizens of the global community hereby dedicate ourselves to achieve a healthy world. And that is the opening sentence of the Nightingale Declaration that still forms the credo for the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health. And by the way, just to let you know that by now we have 11 versions 11 language versions of the Nightingale Declaration. A 12th one is coming on board and we're going to be developing many other versions so that we can use the Nightingale Declaration as an engagement tool to involve people around the world, as well as the ambassadors at the UN who are speaking those languages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw on the NIGH website, all the languages, when you look at the declaration, you can the little drop down right. menu. Yes. And right. that is at um, nighvision.net. That's the website of the yeah. organization. So, did was it the three of you who founded the organization back at that time when you met at that particular conference? That is correct. And let me say, I've also just pulled our Nightingale Declaration. Uh, let me uh, share the rest of it. Please feel free. And I will repeat again, because the opening is so important. So this is a Nightingale Declaration for a Healthy World. We, the nurses, concerned citizens of the global community, hereby dedicate ourselves to achieve a healthy world. Um, we declare our willingness to unite in a program of action. And this is, think about global citizenship here. We declare our willingness to unite in a program of action, to share information and solutions, and to improve health conditions for all humanity, locally, nationally, and globally. We further resolve to adopt personal practices and to implement public policies in our communities and nations, making this goal achievable and inevitable by 2030 is where we're going right now, beginning today in our own lives, in the life of our nations, and in the world at large. So that really speaks to this notion of you start with your own interiority and work That's from right. the inside That's out. Right. So this goes back to what you all were saying much earlier in our conversation. That's correct. So that's taking what some might see as, oh, this is sort of esoteric and seeing how, oh, I can apply this seemingly esoteric concept to how I actually move in the world and change the world around me. Right. Yeah. And how many nurses are involved in in the organization right now? 
Well, it's primarily Diva and Louise and me right now, but then we have network and we have advisors and we have people in different communities that are, you know, if we look at all the people that are taking the Nightingale Initiative and then going out in the communities and doing work, there are hundreds doing it. And I think it's important to go to our website and look at different stories. And so one of the things that we're doing right now is we're trying to touch uh, the lives of student nurses uh, and the importance there and particularly helping them begin. To, if we can help them shape while they're still in school, if we can do it. As you've been in nursing 50 years, you still can wake up. Uh, but with young nurses, because this is who these are the people that are going to change the world, these young nurses. And so to help mm -hmm. them engage and see that. They may be employed by a hospital, a clinic, or a school, but they are global citizens, and they are literally acting and are role models about what we can do to achieve health in our own homes, in our communities, and then whatever we're doing locally, we can begin to write this down. We can write articles. We can have conversations, just like we're doing. We have no idea, once you post this podcast, Who's going to hear it? It could be someone in Turkey, Sweden, or, or wherever. So mm -hmm. the work the war just gets around now. It does. And whether it's a letter to the editor of your exactly. local paper, or you're speaking to your legislator, you're meeting your legislator to talk about some issue that's on your mind, or you, you're a nurse who joins the school council, or you um, run for mayor or run for Congress. We have nurses in Congress. We need many more. I think Diva, Diva Marie needs to consider running for <laughs> well, Congress. I'm a Canadian. That's another conversation. I'd have to run for Parliament. Oh, Diva. Well, that's fine. We, we'll let you run for Parliament. So, Diva, I want to ask you a question. So, in your bio, it says that you led a campaign for the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health to receive special consultative status granted by the UN Economic and Social Council in 2018. So what does it mean and what's that intersection between the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health and the United Nations? <laughs> oh, I won't use that metaphor again. It's, a, it's becoming trite now, but these are big, <laughs> these are big questions. The, uh, yes. the economic and social status with the United Nations is a designation for NGOs working beside the UN on the causes that the UN is working on. And, and, and now all 17 goals are causes the nurses are working on, that, that the UN is working on. So it, we, over the decades, up into 2018, we were working in many ways to demonstrate what we could do to promote UN causes. And I, I won't go mm -hmm. into the list, it's long. But let's just say we worked on a campaign for maternal health in 12, 13, and 14, as an example, when, when the UN was working on saving mothers' lives, uh, Millennium Development Goal number five. And so we, we demonstrated that and did a lot of work for that. So that's an example. We had people working... Uh, in the, within the United Nations in New York and within the United Nations in Geneva. And we pulled out all the, together. We documented all of that and submitted it. Now, so now what does it mean that we have this ECOSOC status with the United Nations? It means that we can, that we're invited to many meetings at the UN. We can, we can easily get badges to be a, a, attending and we can send representatives to the UN and do all of that. And we've done that. But it also means that we are required to bring feedback to the UN. And that's where I'm thinking that we need to find new ways to bring the voices of nurses to UN bureaucrats and UN ambassadors and 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 cite our ECOSOC status and say, well, we have ECOSOC status. That means that we really need to hear the voices of the nurses in Nigeria and the voices of nurses in Bangladesh and the voices of nurses in Mongolia, etc. And and bring that back mm. to the Mongolian, Bengali, and Nigerian ambassadors. 
And that's what we're that's what we're working on at taking this ECOSOC status to more than just showing up and having a privileged access to buildings that have some sort of cachet. I see. And ECOSOC is Economic and Social Council at the right. UN. And right. this brings right. me to that that old adage, which is a cliche, but cliches are cliches for a reason mm. that either you have a seat at the table or you're on the menu. Right. So what I see is that the two of you and what you've been doing through the Night and Go initiative is that you want to be at the table. You don't want to be at the menu and right. you don't want to be on the menu. Right. And if you want to bring in the nurses from Nigeria and you can bring them to the attention of the Nigerian ambassador at the UN, then you're giving them a seat at the table. That's right. So this is that intersectionality that I think is so important. That's what I was trying to gain understanding of is where the UN and your work intersect and how very important it is. So people should absolutely, obviously go to nighvision.net. And this is where they can learn all about the Nightingale Initiative. And right. Barbie, when people want to find you, they go to dossydossy.com. That's D-O-S-S-E-Y. And that's your and Larry's website together, right? Right. Or or the Nightingale industry too. Right. And then I Nurse Coach too. That's the that International correct. Nurse Coach um, Association. So that's right. also important, right. Inca. And right. Diva, when people want to find you, how do they find you? Where do they go? Well, the, the, the Nightingale website, our Nightingale website, but they can also email me at divamarie at earthlink.net. Okay. And that's D-E-V-A. Marie. All Marie. one word. D- mm-hmm. Diva Marie at earthlink.net. Okay. That's great. If they want to have a conversation with you. And be- right. before we close though, I have four quick questions and these aren't big suitcase questions, um, Diva. These are shorter ones that I ask all my my guests. And these have nothing to do with the conversation we're having per se, but they might. And we'll have to keep them kind of short because there's two of you. And Barbie, I'm going to ask you the first question um, and then we'll go to Diva. But how do you define success either personally or professionally? Uh, When I feel a tug of, I've got to do this, I must do this. When I can find like-minded soulmates to share with, and I like to work in the we space. I don't like to work alone. The we space, yeah. Yeah. Now, (laughs) Diva had a head start because she knows what the question is. She didn't have to answer it cold. So, Diva, (laughs) how do you define it? Well, uh, I think that actually goes back to Barbie's point about soul's purpose. Oh. If I'm doing, if I am in touch with my soul's purpose, and I'm, and if I've done even the smallest thing for my soul's purpose today, today is a successful day. Yeah. That's lovely. Okay. Now we're going to let Barbie have the little heads up first. I'll ask Diva the (laughs) next question first. So aside from Florence Nightingale, Diva, how would you describe one person who's had an inspirational impact on you in the course of your life? They can Uh be living or dead. They can be famous, not famous. One person who's just comes to mind who you're like, that person really had something to do with who I became or who I am? Oh, well, I, I, I'm not Catholic, but I, the, the face that came to mind is our current Pope. Oh, do tell. Uh, he, he's an unusual individual. He's, he's now struggling with all the challenges of the Catholic Church's bureaucracy, but he's a good man who has it risen in the ranks beyond his own suffering, his own struggles that if you know about his life has been very, 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 very challenging. He was, he was stuck in the problems of the dictators in Argentina and trying That's to solve funny. that problem. And in his life, he, he was saying he wanted to just stay as a parish priest. And yet he was, for that same reason, he was elevated. To his, to, by the, his fellow cardinals to do what needs to be done to shift the consciousness, the culture of a major impact on the world. 
Hmm. And he's doing that in amazing ways. I could get more into that, but this is a short answer. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay. <laughs> and Barbie, you had a leg up because you got a few minutes to think well, about it. What about you? When you ask the question, of course, Nightingale, Nightingale, Nightingale. Right. But then I look at contemporaries. I am uh, just in awe of uh, Michelle Obama. Hmm. And what inspired, well, there are a zillion things that inspire me about this woman. But to look at the courage for her to always go out on a limb to do a little bit more and to take a deep dive, to really go below the level of the surface. And she is another person that has that capacity to look at working in the we space and pulling people up to see what we can accomplish together. That's really nice. Two really important contemporary people. So Barbie, now your next question, the third one is, is there a book or a movie, and it doesn't have to be your absolute favorite, just just one that has had an impact on either the way you live your life or the way you think? And again, it doesn't have to be a favorite. One? Okay. <laughs> well, we go back to Nightingale. <laughs> okay. That's fine. And the Which reason book? I... Yeah, the reason, well, it is Nightingale's, uh, well, I was looking at the um, biography of Cook, Mm -hmm. but Nightingale's specific work was one that Diva had quoted, the 1893 Sick Nursing and Health Nursing. And as uh, just for people that are listening, I'm a founder of the uh, founding member of the American Holistic Nurses Association. And when I began to read Nightingale, I just absolutely wept. Because I looked at the extraordinary philosophical capacity she had to begin to pull all of these pieces together and what she was able to accomplish in her lifetime. And I also want to say, as we wrap this together, people can be, if they do not know it, go to the website and listen to Nightingale's voice. And all you have to do is just do Florence Nightingale's voice. And she says, when I am no longer even a memory, just a name, I hope my voice perpetuates the great work of my life. God bless my dear old comrades of Balaclava and bring them safe to shore. Hmm. Balaclava in in the Crimea. Crimea, Crimea. where we are right now. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And. Diva, how about you? A book, a film, something that's just had a deep impact on you? Well, I, this may surprise you again. Mm-hmm. Uh, going wide range across my memories, I remember the first time I saw the movie Dances with Wolves. Hmm. At the end of that movie, I stood during the credits, you know how you think you're just with the ending and you're with the power of a, of a movie that moves you. And you're just with those credits. I stood with those credits and I said to myself, this movie is changing collective consciousness about who are these Indians, these quote savages. Because before that, we, I saw Indians as those those terrible people that kept making it hard for white people to cross the plains and and settle in the West. And 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 then I saw who these people are, these wonderful indigenous people with so much knowledge, with so much capacity, with so much civilization in their in their worlds. And that movie shifted so that people are seeing now the Indian, the indigenous people as people with a culture that is needed and wanted. And, and of course, we're still struggling with those, those understandings. But Dances of Wolves shifted collective consciousness. And I was just, I was just, uh, I was so impressed by that. And realizing that that's the kind of movie that needs to be more <laughs> brought to us. We need more of those kinds of movies. I love Indeed. that. And that- Steve, I'll have to comment. Larry and I were living out here in Santa Fe. And when we saw the movie, it was right before Thanksgiving. I will never forget it. And there were about 10 Din Native uh, uh, American Indians in the audience who uh-huh. also stood up and clapped. It was uh-huh. extraordinary. Oh, that gives me chills. I was just, yeah. I was mm. just with them on that. I just saw, I just saw, I myself shifted consciousness. 
Mm-hmm. And I knew that the movie was going to do that for the world. And it has in many ways. It has. And, you know, that brings me, just makes me think of looking at these um, UN Sustainable Development Goals. I look at number 10, reduced inequalities, right? Yeah. That right. really brings me to that right there. And uh, goal 16, peace and justice. Exactly. So it all ties together, doesn't it? Right. Indeed. Wow. Yeah. And then we look at 17, which is about partnerships. Partnership. And yeah. that's what we as nurses know how to do is to truly look at this interprofessional collaboration and bringing in interested citizens into our work. That's right. Now, I have one more question. And Diva Marie, you first. Ah. What's one piece of advice you uh-huh. would give 18-year-old Diva Marie back right uh-huh. now? <laughs> Whether you think she would listen or not. She might not. Probably not. (laughs) What would you say anyway? (laughs) Oh, when I was 18, I didn't want to be a nurse. I thought I couldn't be one. So I think looking back across the decades, I've done so much more than I could have ever dreamed at 18, understood at 18. And so I would just say, don't settle for what you know or think now. Let your life unfold to show you the possibilities as you emerge, as you mature, as you get wiser. When you're 32, you'll see possibilities you don't see now. And when you're 64, the same. Life gives you all kinds of potential. Just allow those, allow that to unfold and don't get stuck in what your 18 year old mind and heart knows. You don't know that much yet. (laughs) Good one. She probably wouldn't listen, but that's okay. (laughs) We're listening. Um, Barbie, would you say Um, something similar? What would you say to 18 year old Barbie? And what I would say to 18 year old Barbie is dream, dream big, and also find what really resonates with you. Mm. And stay with it and begin to feel that inner tug. And if your your heart and your your gut is saying, I gotta do this, do it. Mm-hmm. Again, and not do it alone. Right. Go for the we, right? That's right. Find your soulmate. Yeah. Well, Dr. Barbie Dossi, my dear friend, and Dr. Diva Marie Beck, my new friend. Thank you both so much. This is wonderful. And we could have, you know, unpacked these huge suitcases for hours. Well, we'll do right. it again. But okay. this was a really good first Great. go at it anyway. And Great. I appreciate you both being here so much. Thanks, Keith. We enjoyed it. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Thanks for listening to this awesome episode of the Nurse Keith Show with Dr. Barbie Dossi and Dr. Diva Marie Beck of the Nightingale Initiative for Global Health. And you can find them at nighvision.net. I really do hope you feel uplifted and empowered from this episode. So think about the inspired action you can take every day in the interest of your personal and professional development and in in the interest of the world around you. And if you need personalized holistic career coaching, please look no further than nursekeith.com. Shoot me an email. We can set up an appointment to have a chat. Mention NIGH, mention Barbie or Diva, and you can get 10% off your first coaching package. And consider becoming a patron at patreon.com to help support the show. I would really appreciate it. We're a proud member of the Health Podcast Network at healthpodcastnetwork.com. We're produced by Rob Johnston of 520R Podcasting and Mark Cappy Spiesen is our social media ringmaster and newsletter wrangler. And before we say goodbye, I'll leave you with this quote, one of my very favorites. It's by the musician Robert Fripp. May my living honor my parents. May my living repay the debt of my existence. Be well, dig deep, seek joy, keep in touch. This is Nurse Keith saying adios till next time from beautiful and rainy Santa Fe, New Mexico. Dr. Barbie Dossi saying goodbye from... Santa Fe, and it's raining today. We are thrilled. (laughs) That's right. And the inimitable Dr. Diva Marie Beck bidding you adieu from... From Gatineau, Quebec in Canada. Canada's national capital region. All right. Doctors Dossi and Beck, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for listening. And we will catch you on the proverbial flip side. Mm-hmm.